Hi, uh, everyone. I see three physical beings here. How many others are in Zoom? Three. Absolutely. Okay. okay. And what are your names? Oscar. Oscar. Simon. 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 I made it easy for you, Oscar, as well. Oscar, how do you say it properly in your native language? Oscar. 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 Good. And the others in Zoom, what are their names? Uh, Alan and Philip. Lamy. OK, great. Well, welcome to this uh, event. I was told to do some lectures. I, um, I thought I'll, so I have a total of 180 minutes, right? Uh, Two yeah, lectures, yes. I think. Yeah. Okay. Two times four times. So, so given that we have a global pandemic, I thought I'll I'll cover something that's uh, sort of interest to this uh, study of epidemics today, and then we will see how far we go. So this is actually so I guess maybe the assigned reading. Uh, I'll I'll give a link later, or you can Google search it. It's uh, the following paper called the transmission process. Process, and uh, it's a combinatorial stochastic process. For what? For the evolution of transmission trees over networks. So there's a lot of words there. Networks are essentially science speech for directed uh, graphs, digraphs. So graph just has nodes and uh, vertis uh, or vertices and edges. And uh, when there's a, an, edge, an edge is nothing but a pair of vertices, right? And if, if the pair is ordered, then it's a directed graph. Network is basically a directed graph from uh, applied literature. Now, what is a transmission tree? So we will define this in the process. Tree again is a special type of, of uh, directed graph. And what do we mean by evolution? And of course, uh, the thing we're really going after is the structure. Um, so the, the motivational uh, problem actually was posed by a famous probabilist named uh, David Aldous. He's retired now, uh, Berkeley. So he sort of um, wrote a really interesting paper. So anyway, this this article is sort of your background reading. So we may have assignments based on some Sage Math code. Uh, if you want to do assignment, we can we can figure out what you want to do, right? But I was told that to give you assignments. So um, this actually is a paper that's published in the Journal of Theoretical Biology, or uh, um, and then it's 2016, 137 to Okay. So all this at UC Berkeley. I met him at the International Congress of Mathematicians in India in 2010, and he just basically told me about this paper he was working on, or he just did, and uh, that paper is called, uh, it's called Stochastic Social Dynamics or something. So I highly recommend, at least looking at the abstract of the paper, which should be cited here. Um, so it's called, uh, Yes, stochastic models, no. Uh, yeah, interacting particle systems as stochastic social dynamics in Bernoulli. Uh, and it was published in 2013. 
Okay, so interactive particle systems and stochastic social dynamics. What are these things? Systems as stochastic social dynamics. So what Aldous did is he basically reviewed a large volume of literature in what's called network science. This is essentially a lot of physicists, epidemiologists, theoretical biologists, and so on coming together for the last couple of decades and uh, defining all kinds of models for how, say, diseases spread or how uh, particles interact. In the icing model is the classic one for ferromagnetism. But they came up with much more complicated models, right? The fashionista model, like how fashion spread and how rumors spread and all sorts of things. And that's of interest to various agents, right? So you have social media companies that really need to understand, you know, have some probabilistic description of the dynamics so that they can you know, work on the algorithms and so on. So yeah, interacting particle systems of stochastic social dynamics is a nice paper. In that Aldous basically points out a really big gap in the entire literature to 2013. And the gap is the following. So what he noted is that uh, researchers uh, keep on complicating the model, uh, you know, the sort of interaction models, uh, I don't know exactly what word he used, but um, I'll sort of call this, the interaction model uh, at the expense expense of keeping the network model the network model on which the interaction happens kind of trivial um, on which interactions happen in some sense sort of too trivial. So that was his main sort of. Uh, plea to the research community, I guess, to the probabilist community to uh, say something, you know, to keep the interaction model. This means who transmits to who in a disease context, right? So, for example, um, in epidemiology, which is what we will go into epidemiology, which is the study of how diseases spread, you know, you essentially have vertices uh, which represent. Uh, you know, say vertex, vertex here, a vertex here in the graph, each vertex represents a host. Uh, and then and then there's some kind of a structure. Uh, maybe there's a bi-directed graph here or undirected, it's called sometimes. So the so each vertex or host is in a state, right? So the state of the host can be the simplest case of what we will study, can be infected or susceptible, right? So these are possible states called zero one. So either the host is susceptible to a new infection or it's already been infected, right? So there's just two states. And then there is a contact network, like who could potentially transmit to who, depending on you know the public transportation they take and you know the, the contact network the workplace, where their children go to kindergarten, their children, and so on and so forth, right? So somehow there is this interaction graph that's really there, and uh, and you sort of uh, abstract that to um, to some kind of a network of who can potentially infect who, right? So this uh, this all this calls the geometry. It's also called the topology, and you know something that's inherent about the contact network. So all this question was simple. He was saying, all right, people are really complicating this. You know, they're saying, okay, there's infected, susceptible, recovered, and uh, whatever, um, and so on. So you can make this sort of interaction models arbitrarily complex, but then keep the underlying contact network somewhat simple. So what he means by trivial are the examples are people have already studied this for a long time, especially in the physics community. This is a all to all network. So it's going to put a complete graph in mathematics. So every, so every node, every vertex is connected to every other vertex. So there is in some sense, I don't say no topology, but there is a topology, but it's completely your geometry, but everyone's connected to everyone, right? This is essentially the domain where classical differential equation models assume Okay, um, uh, the ones that are yeah very simple assume this, or, or they or people were giving a uh, sort of um, I don't know uh, in the random graph family people were giving various so 
So a random graph. There's a random graph. A random graph is simply a graph value random variable, which uh, has possibly some parameters, and the parameters are fixed. Every realization of this graph value random variable gives us a random graph. Okay. The simplest random graphs are called the Erdos-Schwenny graph. So this is a couple of famous people, some circles. Uh, Erdos-Schwenny graph. It's a very simple one. I'll briefly describe this. Um, so an Erdos-Schwenny graph has the following. These are all constructive random graphs. That means there is an algorithm that is specified. Uh, and according to this algorithm, you can actually start a construction process that will result in a, in a realization of this random graph. So our training graph is very simple. It says we have a, we should have light from below. But, so we, we have a vertex at V, right? Uh, I'm just gonna use I1, I2 up through, I n for now. Okay, so these are sort of individuals uh, in the in the, say, in the in the setting. These are hosts, and then there is a and then the question is how do you how do you construct the edge set? So let's say one of the, the simplest or rainy, this is fixed, and then you have to somehow kind of pairs of uh, uh, vertices at random. Right. So the simplest one, uh, let's not worry about the exact names. And so basically you flip a coin, flip a coin with uh, probability, um, I don't know, um, P, probability P of, um, of, of coming up, say, hence, okay? So it's the highest coin, and P can be possibly very small. Of course, and then what you do is, uh, so this is the first step. The second step is uh, you choose, uh, um, mm, let me think the right way to do this. Okay, let's do this in a more, uh, in the simplest construction. So you take all and choose two pairs of vertices. So this is a undirected construction. You take all and choose two pairs of vertices. Uh, put them in lexicographic order, and then you simply march through each one and say, flip a coin, independent co coin like this. And if it comes ahead, you connect the, the pair, right? The pair in the queue, say the list. Um, uh, else, if it comes up tails, you do not connect, right? So that's a simplest example of a, of a Constructor, construction, right? So, and then you can do some very simple uh, arithmetic and find out that what is the expectation of the number of edges in the, over this distribution of Erdos Rainy graph as a function of little p and n. And uh, what is this? We expected. I don't know what you guys and girls know and don't know. So I have no idea. Do you know what expectation is? Well, expectation is just the average, right? So, I mean, it's basically, you know, without measure theory and all this, expectation of any random variable x is simply uh, you take, you do uh, an, an addition operation if it's discrete or integral, random variable is continuous. But let's say we, we just, so x is now the number of edges in an Erdos Schrödinger graph. So, uh, so this thing is actually, a, a, you know, essentially a binomial random variable, right? Binomial random variable, the sum of Bernoulli's, which we'll have this is probably one. But basically you take the X, right? Uh, uh, whatever value this is, so some value X takes, and then, and then you multiply it by, uh, by the probability uh, of X happening, right? So and then you sum over all Y's. So it's basically a probability weighted average of the of, of x itself. So of course here x is real valued. Okay, so you, so so what you what you basically can note here is that the first basic insight is p is one. Um, so if p is one, so in this case, yes, yeah, sorry, all these are IDs. So so if p is one, then every every pair you choose, you connect, right? So you're back to a complete graph, right? 
And if P is zero, it's a, it's a sad world, right? It's like uh, what Xi Jinping did to China, the infection, everyone stays home, it's frozen, right? So, uh, so yeah, you know, it's just a set of vertices with no edges, right? That's an extreme. So, but if P is some other value, uh, you know, interesting structures form. Basically, you know, out of the n choose two pairs, because this is undirected, uh, directed graph construction. So n choose two, uh, you know, is the total number, right, of edges, and then you multiply it by P, right? So, so what is this? The interpretation of this arithmetic is that uh, I'm asking whether whether this edge, this particular edge, is uh, one or the other. So if there's an edge, it's one, and then you multiply by p, right? And then there's no edge, zero. You multiply by one minus p, so you can kind of forget about this, right? But then you have to add this n choose two times, right? The summation is n choose two times, so it's basically n choose two times p is the expected number of edges in a Rosh graph. Clear? Undirected edges. I don't want to go too much into uh, random graphs because uh, there's a whole industry, college industry in our department that's like world experts on this, Sante and Cecilia and their whole gang. But I just want to give you a flavor that this is an example of a random graph. And the point to note is that this, this random variable, uh, which is the graph value random variable, has as its support set the set of all possible set of all possible diagraphs, okay? So diagraphs are directed graphs. And um, so on the set of all possible diagraphs for a given P and N, erdos uh random graph takes realization, right? Of course, if we change a random graph model to something else, there will be a different distribution on the set of all possible diagraphs, okay? Um, another nice model that this community really likes, uh, it's used heavily, uh, is called the small world network, right? So I will give you a couple more and then we'll get into the more formal um, lectures or well, okay. Um, we'll see where it goes. So another example uh, of a random graph, um, graph, um, is called the small world network. So, so this was uh, defined by uh, um, Watson Strogatz. So I know them personally, especially Strogatz uh, of Cornell, which is our French monthly state. So what did they say? They they were you know they were more like they were in theoretical and applied mechanics department at the time. I also forget this and maths. He's an applied mathematician um, who yeah who's, who's, who's quite intuitive you know. Uh, so what they did is they observed that uh, in the sort of new worldwide web research there was a very interesting pattern emerging in the way uh, these sort of if you sort of charted out a big subset of the World Wide Web, you have this very interesting um, website, right? So, so here the nodes are websites and edges are hyperlinks that go out and come in to the website, right? So your, your set of vertices is all the websites in the world and then uh, you have hyperlinks as, as uh, directed edges. So what they noticed in this graph and several other graphs that they observed in nature is that, um, you know the sort of the 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 degrees of separation. This is actually a term from sociology. Um, so I think someone named Milgram. Uh, so they, they want to explain this this phenomenon called the degrees of separation. But but actually, yeah, sociologists noted like in the sixties with sending letters. And the idea was that if you actually so the claim is the following. So if you take any two humans at random, okay, in the, at least the English speaking world, I think was the experiment was not in China, which would have been different. But yeah, if you take two random humans in the English speaking world, then they are connected by at most six uh, who knows who relations, right? And so this is say the first who knows who relation. So this is individual A and individual B. We pick at random in some 
universe and then um, and then if you ask you know how how many such uh, such sort of steps I need to go through uh, to to reach from A to B through a link through a set of who knows who relations, right? So and then they, they realize that uh, almost everyone, right? Almost every pair in the universe, uh, say English speaking people, uh, uh, were connected by uh, this path length less than six. So they call this, this path length degrees of separation, okay? So to explain this, uh, this uh, these guys came up with a very simple kind of graph model, right? And that model is very, very much like this. You, you basically have, um, you, you know, without loss of generality, you can just put all the nodes on a ring for now. Um, so this is the first node, the second node, and so on, up to the nth node, right? And then um, you can take any base model where there are local connections, right? So these are, these are not connections. So, so then, uh, so you basically say, okay, everyone is connected to their immediate neighbor or immediate two neighbors in some, some random way. Uh, so you could just flip coins and so on and then get these connections, right? So everyone's connected to the, I'm gonna use, yeah, by the record, I just like this. So you can have something like some kind of local connection. So on, a, on top of a local connection, they basically have this, uh, this other parameter where, some nodes, um, yeah, don't worry about the parameterization, but the idea is that some nodes are not only connected locally, but also they have some, a couple, very rarely, they have a couple random connections, okay, like that. So uh, that sort of geometry uh, in the construction of these random graphs gives rise to what they call the small world phenomenon, which basically explains the slow small degree of separation in the universe right because you only need a few with these random long distance connections and then boom everybody's you know it's not it's very intuitive right so it's another example of a, of a random graph and there's actually several of them so in this paper uh, we give you sort of direct links to the sage math libraries uh, graph library sage yeah, sage math's graph library we can explore like hundred, hundreds of random graph models. So going back to Aldous's criticism, Aldous was saying, okay, people are, people are having fun with these models, which is great, but what's crucially missing is uh, instead of complicating the, the interactions, right? How, how people interact with one another, given the, the, their local neighborhood right, of, of edges, he was saying, okay, let's keep that simple, but, but can you make something, some statement about the topology or the geometry of the graph itself, right? So he sometimes was proposing, you know, we should maybe vary this, this underlying topology, right? Uh, because people were just, there were just people who were only doing small world network and then arguing with others. I mean, these are scientists like meeting each other in the head, no, the reality is small world, blah, blah, blah. So <laughs> it was like this for five, 10 years, right? So now, how do we address Aldous's question? So that was the fundamental problem, right? So what we, I worked with an epidemiologist in the uh, University of Auckland, and I was in New Zealand for almost 10 years. So he is actually in computer science, this is uh, uh, David Welsh, who's co-author of this paper. He actually uh, had these huge grants at that time where they were studying HIV dynamics, right? from a sort of public health point of view. So uh, this is way before COVID, of course. So in the HIV dynamics, they have this object called the transmission tree. So this is something that's defined in this field, transmission tree, and this field is loaded with public money, both uh, in the US, everywhere actually. So this object is called, uh, what, is, what is this field called? Um, uh, I think it's called Philo Dynamic. I have no idea. This must be very old now. It was very hot at that time. Science things just come and go fast. It's called Philo Dynamic Epidemiology. Okay, what is this? Philo is basically how we are interrelated, right? Like phylogeny is the study of species and so on, right? Uh, dynamics moving, epidemiology is yes, so disease spread. So they actually wanted to understand a very, very specific object called the transmission tree. 
so that they can actually send the, the social workers uh, and send alerts to past partners of some very active, you know, I don't know, person who spreads the disease, right? So, that, so there is a very important motivation. And the other big motivation is that from this tree, which we will get into, it somehow encodes who transmits to who, right? And, uh, and what strain of the virus, of the HIV virus, right? So they needed to know this tree so that they can, because they, have, they had DNA sequences of the, of the virus, right, in different hosts. So they could somehow, uh, yeah, you know, either infer the tree or guess what the tree is if they didn't know, or uh, if they knew the tree, then they wanted to know exactly how the strains were uh, passed, you know, into from one host to another. And, and the real operational problems where they needed to know if some hosts had multiple strains and they were like super high priority to quarantine because the drugs will not, like the virus will learn from, okay? So it was like a real problem. Okay, so now what I'm going to do in the next uh, several minutes is give you a, a, an outline of this paper uh, on some lectures, and then we will, we will try to, I'm not sure, ooh, yeah. Um, okay, let me write down the, the intended outline, I don't know what. So anyway, this is motivation, okay? Are there any questions? Okay, so now, so this is sort of, so now we, we specialize to your epidemic settings. So here the networks are called contact networks. And we are interested in the evolution of transmission trees on them. So my main um, outline is the following. Okay. So the first thing I want to convey is uh, the transmission process. I'm basically defining this, the transmission process as a mark of chain. On, uh, on, on, a, on a product space of, I will define these things. This is a contact network with over n nodes. And, um, and some transmission trees. So this is, a, this is a state space of the Markov chain, right? And, um, how many of you know what a Markov chain is? Okay, you know. All right, this is going to be fun. All right, Markov chains are not that big deal, so we will define a Markov chain. If you understand the two-state Markov chain, then it's enough. You understand finitely many state Markov chains. So these are finite state Markov chains. Um, and then what I'll do is next give you three examples. Um, of specific contact networks. These are very easy. This will be a complete graph, uh, path network. So basically the examples will be a complete graph, right? Just call this. Um, and then a path network. Right, so it's just a long path, and I'm going to start. Okay. okay. Um, and then we will try to get into uh, somehow doing a, a, a careful construction that will shed light on the evolution of transmission trees on an arbitrary contact network, right? So this is like pure graph theory. There's no probability at this at this point, and then probability we just add on. So, yeah. 
Okay, so um, this is the so-called beta splitting model. Um, model. So we'll spend more time on this. Let's see, maybe in the next lecture. Um, so it's a it's a it's a construction involving uh, ordered stick breaking process. Uh, this is um, also the unordered version is due to all this. We just made it ordered so, uh, because the transmission trees are ordered. You'll see so stick breaking construction. Um, so in probability, you will have a, there are actually. Uh, uh, there's a lot of interesting, tricky constructions that uh, people have done, clever people have done, and uh, they often shed light on more complex processes. Um, so we will do this. And the beta splitting model will somehow give us insights into other arbitrary compact uh, networks, I mean, the evolution of transmission trees on them. And then we will visit the three examples again and see how these. Uh, how these examples are now seen in light of this, this uh, stick making construction. And then finally, I'll actually one more. So we will look at uh, equivalence classes in um, sort of the initial contact network where before the epidemics about to spread of. Um, I will define these things um, of this, uh, this, this, uh, this structure, which is related to this beta splitting model. Right? So somehow the beta splitting model with this construction induces equivalence classes on the initial compact network before the epidemic grows. And then we want to pin for each equivalence class we want to somehow uh, understand the entire distribution of these uh, transmission trees. And finally, um, some pictures. Okay? Pictures, and then maybe if you bring your computer at the next meeting, uh, I think I lecture again on Wednesday morning. Yeah. So if you bring your laptops uh, and, uh, and install Sage Map on them, then we can actually start playing with some code. Maybe just the last few minutes, okay? Uh, pictures and stage map. Um, this jam. And so I, I should give you a little video today to watch. Um, okay, so so this video is actually a, a bachelor's thesis by Simon. The students just finished a bachelor's thesis with me, uh, God's Kissing. So he actually took all of this paper and, and generalized it, at least in the code space. And I'll tell you that we're already at an open problem in probability and mathematics that Evan Svante can solve. Like Svante, yeah, you know, yes. Maybe one of the, definitely one of the most special humans, in my opinion, mathematical humans in the world now. So um, I'll explain what that problem is. So, so what Simone did is uh, I, I kind of just told him that this is an open problem. I just went to town with this. So he, he extended this to other models, SIS, SIR, uh, and SAER, the same ones that Technel's advisors are using from uh, Stockholm University math department. And um, he slightly formalized it, but um, and then he has done simulations with arbitrary quarantine regimes. So these are a bigger extension because they're you know, control markup chains. So you can kind of study, at least in simulation formally, what happens when you make the academic models much more realistic than the simple SI model. But, uh, but we don't have a, so we don't have a representation for the process properly, right? So you can have simulations that are very, very tight but you still may not have a, a representation, right? But then I mean, like, how exactly do you encode the state space of this much more complicated Markov chain? Because now you need to go beyond things I will explain in the lectures, and maybe you have to get into 
you know, big paths and more, more delicate objects from, from classical combinatorics to, to encode certain things. But at least the code is there, so you can really play with it. Okay, so let's start. So I have 10 minutes now, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so what is a Markov chain? So I guess this is background. So we won't do this in a sort of proper measure theoretic way, more intuition intuitive way. So um, a Markov chain is an example is uh, um, a simple uh, model for um, a sequence of dependent line invariants. Okay. Okay, now, okay, what is a random variable briefly? So, so the simplest random variable, right? Um, so maybe you should see this properly. So there's a man named Paul Magorov. In the 40s, it's so in Russia, uh, he axiomatized probability theory, axioms of probability. probability. Right? So, what do we mean by probability you know, in a mathematical axiomatic sense? Classical Aristotelian logic is the following. So, Kolmogorov's axioms say the following. So, um, the first axiom says that. Uh, well, I'll do the English version. So it says that something happens under this model, right? So what does this mean? This means um, there is a sample space called omega. So in probability theory, uh, uppercase omega is reserved for the so-called sample space. Which essentially, uh, and then you ask, what is the sample space? Sample space is the set of all possible, all possible outcomes of an experiment. Okay. Of an experiment. Now you ask what is an experiment. <laughs> it's something you do in, in reality, right? This is uh, essentially the birth of European empiricism when when say the English church and later on the Swedish church diverged from Catholicism, where they basically were saying, well, we will do empirical analyses that can be repeated. So we don't need the Pope to tell us what reality is, right? It's a part of Charles Law, Boyle's Law, and then the subsequent European Industrial Revolution, right? So that's an experiment and it's just an empirical experiment. So when you do an experiment, the outcome could be one of many possible states, right? So if it's just a simple experiment of tossing a coin in a repeated and controlled way, then the outcome can be just um, right? uh, heads or tails. So omega is in the, you know, um, yeah. So omega is basically, put quotes, zero and one, right? Heads are natural, but heads and tails. Heads and tails. Okay, then the coin tossing experiment. So, um, so if you have a more complex experiment, like uh, uh, you know the amount of rain, right? Um, rainfall measurement. And so in this case, omega would be. You know, either no rain or a, you know, some amount of rain. Some amount of rain, right? I mean, I'm putting this in quotes because it's a bit more complicated, okay? So that's so here, if you have a graduated cylinder, you know, if you have like a little flask. A conical thing, and then you stick a graduated cylinder to measure right how much rain has fallen. 
then the standard thing you would do is you would after the say you, you put this outside on top of Angstrom or whatever, you know, after say 9 a.m. every day, somebody goes and looks at if there's any water here, and you look at the lower meniscus and record exactly where the measurement is, right? And now we have we're looking at like the you know molecules of water coagulating to give you the lower meniscus, and this is already a continuous random variable, right? Because so now we need real, real numbers, Not reality, real number systems already, right? We need Cauchy sequences already they can cuts. So so but then we say okay, the, the lower meniscus is like like touching this just this, and we have resolution on, on what we can see as well. So we sort of give our best guess and we note that it's a continuous random variable. So this step from omega is called a random variable. So it's a measurable map formally. So this could be my random variable X. And then this, this step from going from here to say zero, one, zero for tail and one for heads. These are no numbers, right? Uh, there are still real numbers, non-negative integers. So this is a, say, my random variable y for coin toss. So yeah, so basically Kolmogorov's insights come from his, his sort of hanging out with, uh, with physicists, especially um, the guys who were studying chaotic uh, nonlinear systems and fluids so that heat the fluid from the bottom, some kind of fluid, and then uh, there will be glass beads suspended in the fluid, and the fluid will start like sort of heat will rise, and there will be turbulence, and then these glass beads will move, and they have these you know, 1930s <laughs> laser technology from the Soviet Union, you know, giving measurements, and they were measuring this. So his inspiration for the axioms actually directly come from experiments like that as well, right? So what uh, what what he is basically saying? So when you have these random variables, they're basically called measurable. It means that you know, if I take any, say I take an interval here, right? Let's keep this simple. If I take any interval and ask what's the probability that, you know, what the rain tomorrow or whatever, or any given day, the lower meniscus will land in this tiny interval of non-zero width, then what the axioms essentially say is that for this to be measurable, I need to look at the inverse image in this crazy space. It's not just two elements. This is everything, right? How the clouds moved since like forever, right? So it's the entire possibilities. And then you need to somehow, you know, partition that. And then, um, so every interval will map to some subset of this, of this sort of, I would call it abstract, it's concrete, but, but the inverse images are sort of abstract definitions of this concrete intuition, right? So that's what measurable means. So you have to, you have to be able to take, say things like intervals or more formally Borel sets and then invert them and then uh, these things have to exist. So now probability is defined on omega, right? Okay, so in now uh, how many yet? Am I out of time? So the first axiom basically, okay, the first axiom we write right stuff says the probability of something happening is one, okay? In this sense, right? So you, you have something you measure, you can go back, and then no matter what the measurement is, you know, if you look at the union of all the inverse images of everything that can happen, it should be the entire space. And then we give a, 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 a function, P, uh, which is a set valued function. So P is a set valued function, oh, sorry, uh, it was domain is set, so it's omega, and then a whole bunch of other sets that are subsets of omega. So this is called the sigma algebra, right? So sigma algebra is nothing but a whole bunch of subsets of omega, including itself, and then empty set, that are closed under countable union operations, okay? So, so this is called the set of all possible events, right? Um, right? The set of all possible events. And that's a, a sigma algebra, which is basically closed under countable unions. And probability is a map that goes from this f omega to the unit interval, zero, one, such that these axioms hold. Uh, there are two more axioms, but I'll come to that. Too. So we can maybe start in 15. Okay. So I wasn't prepared to like get into probability, but it's maybe fine to just. Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. 
Perfect. So, uh, so this is the set of events. Events. Events are what we can assign probability to, right? It's an English word event. Uh, and the set is a sigma algebra set. And uh, sigma algebra is simply a collection of subsets of omega, including itself, right? So sigma algebra is this. So what is uh, this one essentially? <coughs> omega is in the collection. And if A is an omega, sorry, if A is in, in the collection, then it implies that A complement, so it's closed under complementation, is also there. Maybe it's too tight. And then the last one is controversial. Okay, so, well, it's, yeah, it's controversial because uh, what kind of operations you can do with the ensuing probability, um, vastly changes. So the third one is basically, say this here. So if you have A1 and A2, so say finitely many events, if um, all of each of these are in the sigma algebra, then, um, then you want the, uh, the union finite union to be also in the sigma algebra. So this one is not, um, so this is called uh, finite union. It's close to finite union. But uh, the more dangerous one is this, where you, I don't say dangerous. So, you know, basically A1, A2, dot, dot, dot. So if you have a countable union, each one of the, the sets are in the sigma algebra, then, then, you know, you also require that the countable union is also there. So each uh, AI is in the sigma algebra, the countable union is also there. So this is called being closed under countable, closed under finite um, or uh, countable uh, unions, right? So this is not as controversial, but this is usually what people assume. So in financial mathematics, you assume this. So because of these, these sort of definitions um, or requirements on what a sigma algebra is, you can do this sort of axioms of probability, which are simply set functions that go from the sigma algebra to the U, to the zero one, right? So the first axiom is that something happens. So the probability of the entire sample space is one. Uh, I'm getting these axioms correct. The then uh, the probability of a complement. So if a is an event, the complement is also the sigma algebra. This is one minus the probability of a. So you know if something happens, the probability p of a then it not happening is one minus the probability of it happening, right? So this is again, uh, these, are, these are sort of linguistic rules induced by these axioms, right? On what we can talk about, uh, about regarding events. And then finally, it's this finite or countable union version. So the probability of, um, so let's say um, the union, of the AIs is uh, less than or equal to uh, the probability of, uh, sorry, the sum of the probabilities of the AIs, okay? And it's less than or equal to because you can have events that intersect possibly. If they don't intersect at all, then the probability of the union of a whole bunch of possibly countably infinitely many non-overlapping events on intersecting events will simply equal to the sum of their individual probabilities. Otherwise, it's less than or equal to. Right? So this is called countable additivity or subadditivity. This is a complementation rule, and this is a uh, yeah. okay. So that's uh, probability. Now, the simplest random variable. Let's just quickly look at this. Is called the 
but there are only random variables. So this is for uh, Bernoulli. So Bernoulli random variable X, right? So, so, so there's some experiment with the sample space. And these are called little omegas. This is some actual outcome, right? An event can be visualized as some set collection of omegas, right? So X actually is a real value random variable that gives the value either zero or one, depending on which omega is realized, right? Maybe this is omega prime, and this is omega, and this one goes to one. So these are points on the real line. So usually you call this little x, the actual value could be one or zero. Every time you repeat the coin toss experiment, you get zero at once. So this is kind of how you visualize uh, for any random variable. The Bernoulli one only takes these two values, right? Depending on which um, is the underlying omega. So we say that the probability of uh, the Bernoulli random variable taking the value little one means one. <laughs> so this thing is equal to P and the probability uh, so, so that means the Bernoulli random variable is parameterized by little p, right? Uh, so, and then if x is zero, it should be one minus the okay. This is the simplest, interesting random variable. And uh, I should also point out the connection to classical non probabilistic deterministic uh, theory is the following. So, this is called maybe. The first example, so this should be example zero, example one. So this is called a point mass random variable. Uh, let's call this, uh, I mean, the convention is usually to put like uh, Greek letters or parameters. So we'll call this theta. So theta is now for a fixed theta in the unit interval, which is the probability the coin comes up heads or success of an event. The same random variable is basically what you infer when you want to build a dam in some hydroelectric dam somewhere up in the mountains in Sweden or New Zealand, because that and then the Bernoulli random variable and the parameter theta of interest becomes what's the probability of this of, of, of this dam breaking in the next 150 years. I mean, there's a lot of that, and, and engineering goes into determining and estimating reliably that one number, but it's actually you know. It doesn't have to be just coin tossing, right? It could be some other. So, example zero point mass random variable. So, now let's say theta is just any real number, right? Let's exclude positive and negative infinity. So, for a given uh, theta that's fixed, a point mass random variable puts basically, uh, it, put, it has probability zero on every other value. Okay, so let's call this point mass random variable also. So y, it's a random variable y, and then this is the little y axis. So these are realizations of y. And for fixed theta, at the value theta, right? This point mass random variable puts probability one here, and then and then there will be a little hole here, right? And then it will be zero elsewhere. Right? So this is basically what's the probability that the point mass random variable y takes the value little y is what I've plotted here, right? So this is zero everywhere. So this is how you see a deterministic uh, variable as a random variable. I mean, then everything kind of goes through because often you're interested in convergence in a sequence of random variables to a deterministic quantity. So this is basically how you would look at this. All right, let's not go too much more into this. The, the, the continuous thing is very similar. Let's just, uh, yeah, let's do one more example. So again, you have this rainfall experiment. Clouds are moving in some complicated way. And then we make a lot of uh, axis this way, like this the realization axis. So this is zero, no rain at all, and then one, two, three, four, some kind of value in the cylinder. And then this is your x and omega. So this, is actually, okay. so this is some particular way the clouds moved, and then the water collected in this sort of. This is your actual observation, right? So now you ask, how am I going to give you the distribution of this random variable, which is continuous? Then you can kind of, you know, okay, this is continuous, so maybe maybe I'm going to use some kind of a density function like this. So this is called a probability density function. 
You may have seen this in, in tensor function. So if you were to draw a, a probability, so this is called a probability mass function for discrete random variables. So this is a probability mass function. And then here, if you want to draw the probability mass function for this, you know, uh, you would actually say, with, so this will be zero, and then for the tail probability, right, this will rise to one minus p. Okay, so then, and then you can go zero elsewhere, and then at one, it will rise to, let's say, p is slightly bigger than one minus p. Okay, so this will be, uh, the height will be p. Okay, and then zero. So that's called the probability mass function of a discrete random variable. Discrete is support set of possible values it can take is at most countably infinite. Here, the support set is, is uncountably infinite. It's the whole positive real line, right? So in this case, you're going to have some kind of a probability density function that reflects, you know, if I want to know what's the probability that this random variable takes value in an interval, then you simply integrate the, the area under this density, right? So this was often called the probability density function. And then if I ask what's the probability of exactly the, the rain falling on some exact real number, then with this integral argument, it will be zero, right? So that's the other thing to bear in mind. So for continuous random variables, you have a dominating measure and it's usually the bag. So you can only get assign probabilities to, to intervals with, of, of positive width, which has positive the bag measure basically, right? The last thing, this, <laughs> this is probably the random variables in like 20 minutes, 15 minutes. The last thing is because this example is such that many days, especially in the summer, right? I will have no rain at all, right? Which means unlike all these numbers, the zero is special for this experiment, right? So and it may actually have a positive value. So at that point, I may actually have a little spike Right, so I'm, I'm, the mass is this way now, so it might be that there was actually a sort of spike, and I might have some 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 value, you know, probability that x uh, is zero is actually possibly going to be greater than zero. So you can have mixtures of continuous densities for part of the space and point masses for part of the space. That's totally normal as well, right? So that's basically random variables, probability theory and so on. So now in this construction, what we have assumed is the following. So you say x1, x2 up to xn are independent and identically distributed random variables with some unknown distribution function. Okay, let's call it F. So this is some, some, some distribution function like, like F is specified like this for point mass, F is specified like this for Bernoulli, and it's more delicate a mixture of point mass and uh, continuous density for this experiment. So no matter what it is, uh, the, the standard uh, experimental framework for engineers and scientists, including everything in artificial intelligence today, is this this is the mathematical model? This is called a product experiment. So why is it called a product experiment? It's because you know it comes from science, right? So if you have n observations, you can now look at this as n to pull each of them have the same distribution f, and they're independent. It means one doesn't affect the other. We haven't defined independence, but basically the probability of one occurring does not affect the probability of the other's occurrence. And so essentially joint probability of both occurring is given by the product of each one. That's independence basically. Then what 
is nice about the product experiment is if I view the all n as a, as an n tuple as a one point in this product space, you know where x's live, right? So here in the product space, yeah. So anyway, so then then I can say this has distribution f product n. So I multiply the distribution n times. I mean, and now I can see this as a point in this in this product uh, experiment. And this is very rich. This is essentially what scientists do, engineers do, and so on, right? Uh, because you have repeatability and you have symmetry using controlled experiments, and you can learn something from nature. Right? That's basically science, right? And now, the problem is we want to maybe move beyond this and say, okay, I actually have, want to study more closely. Um, a sequence of random variables where the previous or the past somehow may affect the, the future. Okay, so that's the birth of Markov chain. So, so if I have x1, x2, and so on, and if I have something like this, and I don't, you know, I don't want this IID assumption, I want this to be um, so that these this sequence of random variables is such that <laughs> the past. Okay, so here there's a notion of time. So this is discrete time, one, two, three, uh, such that the past uh, is allowed to affect the future, allowed uh, to affect, let's say the present, the future has an happened, right? Let's say you're at some time t, discrete time t, and what you're saying is that I will, I will allow the past to affect the distribution of the current state, then that's essentially called the Markov chain, okay? Uh, so what, what the assumption here is that, and the Markov chain is the simplest model of that. So let's say dot, 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 and my current time, right? So, so yeah, so these are just uh, integers, uh, the sweet time. So what this basically says is the probability that x sub t uh, takes on some, some, some value, little x sub t, right? Um, and x t minus one takes on the value x t minus one, all the way to x uh, one taking the value little x one, right? This is the joint distribution of that t to both, right? Just like this. Uh, in this case, this simply broke down into products. You could just do, because of this IID assumption, you could just P of XT equals XT multiplied by each of these, right? Now we can. So now we have to somehow say this probability, after some other definitions on conditional probability and so on, essentially becomes one of this. So it's the probability that XT equals XT given xt minus one equals this, right? And if, if we only have first order Markov dependence, which means the present only depends on the immediate past, not the entire past, which is fine, it's the simplest one, then you essentially can break down this joint probability into this, right? And then you multiply it by probability of xt minus one, Equaling uh, x t minus one given x t minus two and so on. Equaling x t minus two, okay. and then these these given are conditional statements. Okay, so it means the probability of x t is conditioned, or it depends on what actually happened at t minus one. Okay, so that's the only difference, and in this setting, it doesn't matter. So let's look at the simplest possible Markov chain. Um, two states, Markov chain. Uh, two states. Uh, let's look at a sort of discrete version of this. So here we, we, we have this experiment of whether it rained or not. And then if it happened to be zero, we call it dry, dry day. And if it's anything, beyond besides zero, we call it wet. So it's just a two state compression of this. So just to keep it simple, two states dry and wet. So then uh, let's say dry is zero, 
and back this one. Um, so now these are random variables. So what we can essentially do is that uh, you know if if being dry or wet is completely independent, then we have a Bernoulli process, you know, the product Bernoulli process, because we simply flip this coin, the magical coin that tells us whether tomorrow will be dry or wet. Right? That's this experiment. But of course, that's not so realistic, right? So the simplest one is if if what is the probability tomorrow is dry, given that today is wet, and vice versa, right? So then we can say that's this probability. So what's the probability that tomorrow is uh, dry, given today is dry? That's little p zero zero. What is the probability tomorrow is wet, given today is dry? Tomorrow is wet, given today is wet. Tomorrow is dry, given today is wet. Okay. So now there are four probabilities, right? And um, but then we have some constraints. Okay, so we've somehow captured the sort of immediate, you know, today depending on yesterday only for this. But there are because of axioms of probability, right? These two numbers should sum to one, right? Because given today is dry, tomorrow is going to be either dry or wet. So these two should sum to one, and in the same way, these two should sum to one. So effectively, we only have two free parameters in the simplex. Okay, so you can kind of think of this, these two things, like already the Bernoulli random variable P and one minus P is actually a point in this, I don't know what you call this in maths, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a unit simplex into two space, right? So this is zero, zero, X is one, one is zero, and then uh, X is, sorry. So X is uh, X. <laughs> I always get confused. So yeah, so then this this is half half, right? So that's basically a fair coin, right? So every point on this on this two simplex uh, is actually uh, yeah is, is actually so p and one minus p. So in the same way, this this thing is a point somewhere here, and this thing is another point here. Right? So so you can think of this as being something here, and this as being something here. Some other yeah, it will always be on the line, right? Yeah, exactly, because every point on this line, this ordered pair will sum to one. I mean, if you see it like this, it's a classical, yeah. what is this called, a uh, plane, Euclidean plane. Yeah, and, and you can quickly generalize this, right? So if I, if I have three, so if I have dry, wet, and like crazy wet. I don't know. So if I have three states of weather, then I can basically call them as zero, one, and two, zero, one, and two. And then you have three numbers right in each row. So each of those three numbers will be points on this uh, three simplex, depending on how to see on this triangle, right? Because this will be zero, 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 and the midpoint of this sort of triangle on the right on the plane will be one third, one third, one third. And then every, you know, if I move here, it's, it's, it's like, I don't know, like Sahara, like, okay. I don't wanna make examples now, but yeah, you see, you, you can basically have three points that determine the three rows here. And this, this whole thing is like really heavily used a lot of machine learning and algorithms and so on. These are called Bernoulli processes and Silverlin teaches a lot of stuff on them as well, crazy. More stuff on this, but just remember that this is a very, very simple way of going from independence to dependence, and that's enough to, to appreciate the rest of the lecture. Right? So, yeah, so in, in some sense, you know, mechanically, you can think that I, I'm in one of zero, uh, one to uh, S, or let's say K. So let's say I have a K state Markov chain in discrete time. So this is a two state Markov chain, right? Uh, okay, K state Markov chain. So from zero to K minus one. Then what's the, the idea? The idea is that I'm currently, say I start at state one. You start somewhere. So initially at the probability one, you are in this state, state one. And then I have to decide, so think of state one as a lounge and it has doors to other states, right? And there is like a big, um, 
Um, so, you know, this is K states, right? So there is a K, K sided convex uh, polygonal cylinder. Like Toblerone bar is a three sided cylinder, right? So this is a convex polygon and it's fabricated with a different load, you know, like uh, the center of mass is different, not just uniform. So you basically roll this K sided cone, like a K cone. And then, uh, and then whatever outcome that comes through, so you can say that the side that contacts the ground is when it comes to rest is the real thing. So I look at it and that tells me which lounge I should move to next, right? So then I open the door to the, say maybe it tells me go to, go to zero because zero came up from rolling, came down on the floor. And then I can go to zero and there'll be another key gong with different weighting schemes there. That you have to roll to get out of there. So you can think like this. So that's basically a two state or a finite state Markov chain. And then this is called the transition probability matrix of this. And we will be defining um, we'll be defining the transition probability matrix for the transmission tree. Uh, okay, so maybe I'll stop now with the actual lectures. So are there any questions up to now? Like the Markov chain, is that just uh, probability that's depending on the past events? Yes. So the Markov chain is basically this, you know, it's like, it allows us to talk about the, the future probability. Mm -hmm. Depending on the current probability, the current state. Of the... So Markov chain is the word for the sequence. So x1, x2 up through dot 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 is a Markov chain on yeah. some state space with case. You know, case but the states. variables are independent on each other, but you do them um, depending on each other. Is that? Yeah. So yeah, exactly. So the x. So what value x t will take? Uh -huh. Will depend on the history up to the most re only up to the most recent actual value the chain took, right? So it may be in x t minus one will be say it's in one of these specific lounges, one of these specific states, x t minus one. Then the Markov chain, you basically have to generate the next x t, capital x t, right? Which which comes from you know. Uh, the, 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 the probability row, you know, the transition probability row of the state you're currently in. So it's no kind of prediction. No, it's just it's called a dependent random variable. So the, the other way to think about this is this if you have an independent, completely independent sequence of random variables, then and if you wrote a Markov chain for it, then every row will be identical. If it's an independent process, right? No matter where you are, which state you are, you always go to one of the other states in the same way, right? So every row, this transition probability row, is identical, then it's an independent sequence of random variables. If at least one of them is not, then it's called a Markov chain. It's, mm -hmm. it's called a Markov chain. So you can call it a a dependent sequence of random variables with first order dependence on finite time, and, but it's called more because I think Markov, Andre Markov, uh, invented this or popularized this. Is that clear? Kind of. Yeah, I mean, this is something you learn over several weeks and probably one, right? So, so yeah, so you don't have to fully, you know. About it, but let's leave the outline alone. And yeah, I mean, the proper way to do this is to define like filtrations and of the same algebras and, and, and define what's conditional probability. And so we do this, uh, I think you would see that in probability theory too, or if you take the introduction to data science course at the first year master's level, that's how Benny Oglin is introducing it. Okay, so now let's uh, let's get back into this. Um, so let me give you the the, the main uh, ideas now. So 
Um, so the transmission process, I'm going to call this TP, um, I said is a, as a markup chain, MC. But then it's a markup chain that uh, um, um, values. So these are you know what values it takes. You can think of them as states. Um, C little C little C is now an, an ordered pair of little w and little s. So what are these? So these are now elements of the state space. Script C sub n. What script C sub n? Script C sub n is defined to be to be uh, two to the power of um, w n. Define what w n is. Crossed with zero one. Right. So what is WM? So where W uh, sub M is, uh, I'll write it in English for now, uh, is the weighted. So a weighted edge is simply an edge, which is like a, think of an arrow going between a pair of vertices. Uh, and then you can you can decorate that arrow with uh, what are called properties. So a weight is simply a number you put to that. Uh, you know it can be some real number. So it's called a weighted weighted edge. So so WN is a weighted edge set of complete weighted. Director graph um, of network K N. Okay. Um, so, you, so you can simply think of there are n vertices, and there is an edge from every vertex to another vertex, right? So that's basically n square minus n, right? Um, possible um, pairings. And then each of those pairings has a real number, uh, a weight associated with it. So that's what we call the, the, the weighted edge set of the complete weighted directed graph. Now, we, we, we look at all possible, so 2 to the power of Wn is all possible subsets of the weighted complete graph. So two to the power of any set is it's the, it's the it's the power set. It's the set of all subsets of that. Do you know? I'm not sure. I'm not that. Okay. Finish. Right. Okay. So let's say you have a set A. Oh, uh, I don't want to do too many. Okay. Let's just do the to B. This blows up fast, right? So then we say two to the A is the set of all subsets of the set, right? In this case, only two. So so, so you can think of it from a sort of Boolean algebra point of view. So you first ask, is little a in this in this set? Uh, so this is a descriptor Boolean descriptor. So yes, yes, B is in it, A is in it. So this means this encodes the set A itself, right? And then the next set will be, I just want zero, one, which means this is, is A in there? No, is B in there? Yes, so this is the set B, right? And so on. And then zero, zero will be the empty set, right? Set that contains nothing. And then one zero will be uh, is A in there, yes, B in there, no, right? So this is so you know it's like one, one, zero, one, and so on, right? So this is essentially a way of encoding with a Boolean question, yes or no, whether an element is in it or not. So that's why it's two to the power, because it's you know always two times two times two. So this is, yeah, if A has two elements, that'll be four, right? So that's, that's called a power set, set of all subsets of the set. So I want the set of all subsets of this weighted edge set, right, of the complete graph. So if I have only four nodes, right, 
So I'm going to put all, it's already going to get messy. Uh, <laughs> to get the idea, right? So uh, let's this separately. So then, okay, so everyone is connected to everyone. Every pair is connected to every pair. This is called K4. Okay? And what is weighted K4? Weighted K4 is like there are weights specifically associated with each of them. Okay. So I can put weight one without loss of gem. You know, they could be different, but I think in this whole thing, we only put weight one. Okay. Something like this. And then it's the set of all subsets of, 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 of this weighted KM. Right. So that's what two to the WN is. Yeah. Well, how would it be if, if we weigh them to, to two instead of one? How would it like affect the... Oh, okay, that's a good... Uh, well... Um, like any, any specific number, it doesn't matter if it's so two or... Because we're only interested in the topology of the, of the network. Uh -huh. So we just want to know whether it's there or not there. You, you'll see later. Okay. So putting any non... Putting a, a, another... Uh, non-negative real valued weight on top of this is not topologically interesting. Okay, so why do we have? We well, have to wait for a little bit more definitions because I would even define the transmission tree. So we won't okay. know the motivation for this definition for a little bit longer. But but basically one or zero from a pure uh, very good question. But from a very uh, right now urgently, what you should realize is that I'm putting just weights one. Because when I look at subsets, right, so I can remove this. And it's weight zero. So this is a particular subset of, of so let's call this, you know, one weighted two K four, and I'm looking at the powers, power set, right? So this is an example of a subset of this power set of one weighted complete graph. And I remove this because the subset, you know, it's included. Mm -hmm. And these ones just tell me that there is a flow. Yeah. Okay. So otherwise, it's zero flow. Because then you have no edge. Or well, I remove them, so it's not quite zero flow because I put everything as one, and then I consider all possible subsets, right? So I don't need to put zero. I can put everything as one, and then remove them because I'm only interested in this particular subset for now. Okay. So it's just a way of. It's basically going back to Alice's question, right? He said. Hey guys, can you actually talk about how something is transmitting on a network where the, the fundamental parameterized variable is all possible networks? So this is a trivial way to just say, okay, the complete graph is connects everything to everything. So the set of all subsets of the complete graph is every other directed graph. And then I just put a weight one because yeah, it's just the future I want to generalize it. Yeah, and it, 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 it captures the topology and the geometry of the contact. Network. Yeah, I get the, the part where the we have different subsets. It's just the way that the, like, the way the parts, I don't understand, but if you will come to that later. Yeah, yeah, I will. But right now, just to say that the edge has a value one. Okay, yeah. Because it, it matters in the future. Right? <laughs> uh, and it, it, it matters to connect it to all of the network scientists' lingo because they, they put real values and so on. And then we show that this is enough. And then if you have real values, you can treat that part separately. Because the topology of who's connected to who is not affected by these weights because the interpretation of the real value non negative weights is how frequently can edge communicate, you know, one host communicates with another. That's how they use it in the future, right? But for us, we are only interested in the in the in, in what is all possible. So. so you can see that more like if we talk about uh, epidemiology, mm -hmm. epidemiology, yeah, uh, like how frequently two hosts uh, like interact with each other, and how likely the time exactly, the exactly. Program. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Very good. So yeah, that's exactly what the the epidemiologists do, right? Yeah. So like where all the simulations that they now gets from like, I guess, Tom, um, this other mathematician. So yeah, they use weighted things because they say, oh, this node is connected to that node with a very high probability because they are in the same workplace, right? So they'll have different kinds of ways they aggregate. And that's very valid, but our sort of approach is like topological and support level, right? So we are only interested whether it's 
connectable at all or not. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's it. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Good, so now let's continue. Uh, okay. so, at least I'll try and define a transmission tree before today, right? And then we can finish the rest. I thought I will be done with the everything today. Oh, but it's good though, keep asking questions about them. Um, okay, so now, right, what do we want? The next thing we want is, uh, so what is the zero and one? Um, so, so zero and one uh, stands for, oh, sorry, I forgot one important thing. This is raised to the power of I and B B I sub n, this zero one. So what is this now? So I n where, oh crap, maybe I should delete this. So when I n, so we define W n, two to the W n. Now what is zero one to the power of I n? So, um, so I n is defined to be, uh, the vertex set the label vertex set uh, formally is labeled vertex set uh, um, I one I two up to I n of the individuals individual hosts um, in a population of size n. Right. So once again, um, it's so have you seen the notation zero one? Raising a set to the power of another set, it means something, do you know what it means? Okay, so basically it's like, a, it's very similar to this with another level of resolution. So intuitively you can think like this. So if I have these IN individuals, right? Uh, whatever the edges between them, independent of that, these individuals are now, uh, let's say this is, I1, I2, I3, say N is three, right? Then the question is, they can be, each individual can be in a state of either zero or one. Zero is susceptible, one is infected. So you can think of them as color rings. So if all of them are one, then it will be like this, right? So all of them being one is actually an element of zero, one to the IA. All of them being zero is an element of zero, one to the i n, and so on, right? So it's basically the the set of all two state colorings of the n individuals. Yeah, I mean it's the set of maps from i n into zero one. Yeah, that's actually much better. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's the set of maps. Yeah, actually that's the last one. Maps uh, from i n. Zero. That's the definition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some set raised to the power of i n, right? So, okay. So then you get the idea, right? So somehow this guy encodes the possible edges that can be, and this guy encodes the set of uh, states each host can be. In. Okay. So that's. Um, that's what we call script CN, right? And um, in some sense, uh, yeah, so zero uh, is susceptible. Susceptible. So you could, you, you're susceptible to getting infected, and one is infected. Okay. Um, so now uh, CN, is called the susceptible infected tag. This is some epidemiological rule, right? 
SI tag contact network. It's called the uh, uh, space, state space. SI tagged contact networks and or SICNs. And our markup chains are going to be running on this state space. Not two states, but still finitely many, right? So we're out of time, I guess. So yeah. we'll continue with transmission trees and some examples uh, the next lecture. Are there any final burning questions? <laughs> <laughs>